again for being uh, so involved. It's difficult, I think, to be passionate yet maintain respect, but I think both of you did an excellent job in that area. Uh, but we, will have, we have another topic, and that would be, is Jesus a prophet of Islam? And we'll have a roughly an hour to go through this. In this case, Dr. Shabir will open up with his 10-minute opening statement. The clock is set. We'll go right into that right now. We'll be taking a break in just a few minutes. But right now, Dr. Shabir, please get started. Uh, folks, uh, I'm glad to be speaking to you again in an opening presentation. Now on the topic, uh, is Jesus a prophet of Islam? I would obviously say yes, and uh, that leads me to explain, uh, is he a prophet and uh, does he teach uh, Muslim uh, doctrines? Uh, first of all, it is very clear, not only in the Quran, but also in the Bible, that Jesus is a prophet. In fact, this is the one thing that is uh, uh, known uh, from his own uh, teachings consistently and repeatedly, even in the earliest uh, sources. Uh, and in fact, even in the later developed teaching in the Gospel according to John, for example, we have Jesus identifying himself as a prophet, which is very interesting because uh, John uh, wants to tell us that Jesus is the uh, word of God from all eternity, that he was there for right from the very beginning. And uh, in some sense, Christians would take that to mean that Jesus is God himself. But notice that he cannot be God himself and also God's prophet at the same time, because a prophet by definition uh, from the Greek prophetes is uh, one who speaks on behalf of another. Uh, so a prophet of God is one who speaks on behalf of God. It's not God himself coming to speak. God does not become his own prophet. Somebody else speaks on his, his behalf, that somebody else is a prophet. So if Jesus is speaking on behalf of God, he's not God, and he's not ontologically the son of God. He is a servant and messenger of God, designated by God to go and preach his uh, message. Uh, so did he teach uh, Muslim doctrines? The, mo the most uh, important doctrine in Islam is the belief that there is only one God, and uh, by extension that Jesus is uh, a servant and messenger of this one God. And in fact, this uh, uh, teaching is uh, found in the, in the Bible as well. Uh, in fact, when we look at uh, passages which Christians often uh, introduce to show that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, as we saw in the previous debate, either that passage could mean that uh, Jesus is claiming to be a Son of God as meaning a beloved person to God, one who is approved by God and not necessarily God himself or, or ontologically Son of God, uh, or that could be a passage which is introduced by somebody else uh, trying to make Jesus look like more than just simply a, a beloved uh, person to God, that he's ontologically uh, son of God. But uh, when we look at the doctrines carefully, we see that in fact, uh, Jesus on whom be peace was teaching monotheism. He himself was praying to God. Uh, in the gospel according to Matthew in chapter 26, verse number 39, he fell on his face and prayed so uh, he's, he was praying in the manner in which Muslims pray, by falling on our faces, we pray to God. And if he was praying to God, then, th then it is clear that he himself is not the God to whom he is praying. He demonstrated himself to be a servant, a messenger, and a worshiper uh, of the Almighty God. So he taught monotheism. So how did that monotheism get lost? Uh, and is it possible for Christians to retrace their steps and find it again? I would say it got lost through the writing and rewriting of the story of Jesus. When we go from Mark to Matthew and Luke, we see how the story has been rewritten, starting with Mark, which uh, uh, David has agreed is the earliest uh, of the four Gospels. Uh, then we go to Matthew and Luke and we see that the story has changed. The, the same incident being reported differently. For example, when Jesus in the Gospel according to Mark was asked about the greatest of all his commandments, he correctly uh, reported uh, that the greatest commandment is what we know from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4 in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, uh, and then it follows up with, love your God, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. But then when we go to Matthew's rendition of the same incident, and Jesus has asked the same question, but now he does not give the Shema Yisrael from, from the book of Deuteronomy. He just skips that part about, about the monotheism, and uh, he goes right into love your God. And this, of course, is what uh, our Christian friends uh, remember. Just love God and everything will be okay. Now, we like the message of love, and that's good. And Muslims need to uh, incorporate more of that message of love. The Quran actually praises our Christian friends uh, for this message of love. Uh, it says that God has placed in the uh, be believing Christians 
uh, in, their, in their hearts, mawaddatan wa rahmah, love and uh, mercy. So Muslims need to uh, also copy that uh, good trait. We don't condemn the, what is good and we accept what is good regardless of where it is uh, found. But the important uh, part of that statement about monotheism, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, is dropped by Matthew. And that shows that Matthew is heading in a different direction here, and he's heading towards Trinitarian doctrine. It's not Trinitarian yet. In Matthew, uh, towards the end, where, where Jesus says, go and baptize uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, some will take that as an expression of Trinitarian doctrine. But in fact, uh, as Robert Gondry says in his commentary on Matthew's Gospel, it does not actually mean that. It does not mean that the three, has, the three of them have just one name. It means uh, go and baptize with fundamental reference to the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that the three are one. In fact, we don't have any passage in the New Testament uh, Gospels or any other writings in the New Testament saying that uh, the three, uh, Father, Son, and, and Holy Ghost, together are one uh, God. Uh, quite to the contrary, we find that again and again, Jesus' uh, original teachings point to the fact that he is a monotheist and he's a servant of God. In Mark's gospel, when he was uh, approached and asked, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? He said, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now, if we go to Matthew's gospel and see that Matthew has actually transformed that episode so that the question is no longer starting with good teacher, it's only starting with teacher, and now the word good is, is uh, advanced to good deed. What good deed must I do? So Matthew has changed it so Jesus does not have to repudiate the title good. And in fact, in Matthew's gospel, he does not repudiate the title. He just uh, talks about uh, doing good deeds. So we have in Mark's gospel, the repudiation of that title good. In Mark, Matthew's gospel, it is dropped. Uh, similarly, when Jesus uh, in Mark's gospel approached a fig tree, thinking that he will find uh, on it some fruit, and he didn't find any fruit because it was not the season for figs, it makes Jesus appear as a human being, not having the full knowledge of God and not knowing even that it was not the right season to expect figs from trees. Uh, but Matthew's gospel giving us the same uh, incident has so transformed the story that uh, it does not uh, reveal the ignorance uh, here of, of the person in question, and it leaves it open for us to give a moralizing uh, em emphasis on this uh, story, a and, and we no longer see that Jesus was a human being like other human beings, not knowing uh, perhaps uh, from a distance whether a tree has uh, figs or not. So we see that the story about Jesus has actually been transformed from an original uh, monotheistic uh, doctrine where Jesus is a prophet and servant of God. He's teaching Islamic monotheism uh, and uh, by extension Jewish monotheism as well. And uh, later on, that teaching is uh, heading towards the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. We see a similar development when we come to think about the uh, possibility that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Uh, and the Gospel according to Mark, it was uh, uh, doubtful as to whether or not Jesus uh, died on the cross. Uh, because the Gospel according to Mark simply said that he expired, and when uh, Pilate was requested permission to take down the body of Jesus for burial, Pilate was amazed that Jesus could have died so soon. And uh, he was assured by the centurion, but by this time the centurion was already a believer in Jesus and had no reason to see Jesus dead. In fact, we have other uh, indications in the Gospels that even Pilate did not have enough interest in killing Jesus. He wanted Jesus to go free, but his arm was being twisted by the mobs who were saying, if you don't uh, deal with him, we'll report you to Caesar. And uh, even though his wife also did not want to, uh, Jesus to be killed, seeing, seeing uh, many di different dreams that will indicate that uh, Jesus should not be killed, eventually uh, so uh, things were flowing for the crucifixion of Jesus to take place. If Pilate could look the other way while Jesus was taken down from the cross alive, then why shouldn't he allow that? And in fact, it seems better to think that Jesus was taken down put in the tomb, and uh, from the tomb he was raised up into heaven. In fact, uh, Reginald Fuller, in his uh, book on uh, uh, the development uh, of the story of the resurrection, uh, actually shows that this was an early belief that many Christians uh, had. And uh, Daniel Smith, in his book, The Postmortem Vindication of Jesus and the uh, Gospel uh, the things gospel Q uh, shows that there are indications in that earlier gospel, the Q gospel, uh, that uh, Jesus did not actually die on the cross and perhaps he was taken down uh, and, and uh, that he was actually translated into heaven right from the tomb. So what do we have in, in the final analysis? In the final analysis we have it that uh, Jesus on whom be peace was a servant, a messenger of God, he was a prophet, 
and he was teaching uh, Islamic monotheism and uh, at the same time Jewish monotheism, and that he did not, uh, the, the proof that he rose from the dead uh, is not so very clear in the New Testament, and it seems that the Quran had an interesting insight by saying they had doubts uh, concerning uh, the incident. They thought they had killed him and crucified him, but in fact they had not succeeded in their attempt, and Jesus was rescued and raised to heaven by God. Now finally, the Quran comes in as a revelation from God to bring us back to the original monotheism of Jesus, to tell us that Jesus was not son of God or God, but he was the prophet of God, God's Messiah, God's servant, and one teaching Muslim monotheism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shabir, and uh, thank you for your opening uh, comments here, 10 minutes. Uh, we're resetting the clock here for David, and you can start right now. Thank you, Shabir. And, uh it is sad that Allah had to wait 600 years to correct all of that, uh, all of that misinformation. Uh, but let's look through this. In Mark 9.31, Jesus tells his followers, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. In Mark 10.45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Mark 2, 28, Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. In Matthew 22, 41 to 45, he claims to be the Lord of King David. In Matthew 25, 30, 31 to 46, Jesus tells his followers that he's the final judge who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Jesus says that he has a, an absolutely unique relationship with the Father, Matthew 11, 27, that he can answer prayers, John 14, 13 to 14, that he is present wherever his followers are gathered, that's Matthew 18, 20, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18, that he is with his followers forever, Matthew 28, 20, and that the entire universe is his personal property, John 16, 15. Doesn't sound like a very good Muslim prophet to me, but that's what we find when we examine the first century sources. So in order to preserve the Islamic view of Jesus, Muslims have no choice but to say that Jesus' message has been horribly corrupted. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm going to the text right here. The, the same text that I'm quoting are the texts that Shabir is quoting to show that Jesus was a good Muslim prophet. Those same texts say all of the things I just mentioned. Now, why, why believe some and not believe others? Well, it's because Islam is used to distinguish what's true from what's false in the Gospels. Uh, but there's a problem here. Muslims think that they have a higher view of Jesus, a theologically superior view of Jesus. I see things differently because a closer look at the Islamic view shows that it portrays God as incompetent and deceptive, and it, it portrays Jesus as the most stupendous failure in the history of the prophets. According to the Quran, Allah not only corrupted Jesus' message, but also helped Christians spread the false teachings. To understand why Islam demands this view, let us consider seven facts. Fact number one, the Quran states that Jesus was a messenger of Allah and a prophet of Islam. Surah 19, 23 to 33 tells us that Jesus began preaching Islamic theology as a baby. And Surah 42 verse 13 says that Jesus preached the same message as Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Muhammad. Fact number two, the Quran states that Jesus won a number of followers who are Muslims. So Jesus spent his life preaching Islam and, here's the key, he was successful. Surah 3 verse 52 and Surah 5 verse 111 say that his followers converted to Islam. So he had Muslim followers. Fact number three, in the Quran, Allah promises Jesus that his followers will be superior to the unbelievers until the day of resurrection. Notice that is a very long time and hasn't even, we haven't even reached that day yet. Allah doesn't say, sorry Jesus, but your disciples are going to be led astray by the apostle Paul. Instead, Allah promises complete victory for Jesus' followers. Surah 3, verse 55. Behold, Allah said, O oh Jesus, I will take you and raise you to myself and clear you of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow you superior to, the, to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Again, since the day of resurrection hadn't arri hasn't arrived yet, Allah's promise is still in effect. Fact number four, if there were any first century Jews who converted to Islam at Jesus' preaching, they didn't last very long. We have a lot of historical information, a lot of, a lot of sources on Jesus' disciples, but we have no evidence at all that any of them believed anything remotely resembling Islam. Jesus' followers believed in his death for sins and his resurrection from the dead. They called him Lord and Son of God. 
We also know about people who rejected Jesus, people who accused him of blasphemy, but no Muslims. So if you want to believe that Jesus had Muslim followers, that's up to you. My point here is that if they did exist, they were so insignificant, we have no record that they even existed. Fact number five, according to Islam, Allah corrupted the gospel through the power of illusion, deceiving people into believing that Jesus died on the cross. History shows that Jesus' early followers became convinced that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. So the obvious reason there were no Muslim followers of Jesus after he ascended into heaven is that his followers came to believe he died on the cross and rose from the dead. Now, according to Islam, where did they get the idea that Jesus died on the cross? Where'd they come up with that one? Surah 4, verse 157 and 158, we learn that Allah tricked people into believing that Jesus was crucified. Allah disguised one of Jesus' disciples, made him look like Jesus. Then this disciple was crucified, but Allah made everyone think that it was Jesus. So when my Muslim friends say that the gospel has been corrupted, we need to be clear that according to Islam, at least part of the gospel was corrupted by Allah himself. Fact number six, the Quran states that Allah helped spread Christianity. Once Allah had deceived countless people, thereby corrupting Jesus' message, he worked diligently to help Christians spread their corrupt gospel. Surah 61, verse 14, O you who believe, be helpers in the cause of Allah, as Jesus, son of Mary, said to his disciples, who are my helpers in the cause of Allah? The disciples said, we are helpers in the cause of Allah. So a party of the children of Israel believed, and another party disbelieved. Then we aided those who believed against their enemy, and they became uppermost. So Allah helped, he aided the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost. Now, the only Christians who ever became uppermost over anyone were Christians who believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, all of which are false doctrines according to Islam. So if these Christians became uppermost through the power of Allah, we can only conclude that Allah helped spread a corrupt version of Christianity instead of giving us the true version. Fact number seven, the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Christian scriptures. In Surah 5, verse 47, Allah says... Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Why would Allah tell us to judge by a corrupt book if it's corrupt and we need to pick out the parts that agree with Islam? Why not just tell us to believe the Quran? We have to start with the Quran and then go back to the gospel. Why not just go with the Quran? Why even go to this book that says Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead? In Surah 5, verse 68, Allah tells Muslims to say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. If the Quran is the only revelation that matters and everything else needs to be interpreted in light of it, why even tell us to stand upon the Torah and the gospel? What's the point of it? It no longer has a point. Surah 7, verse 157, Allah declares, those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. This assumes we still have the gospel. Allah says we have the gospel. Now, based on these facts, we have some questions for our Muslim friends. One, why would Allah corrupt Jesus' message and destroy everything Jesus had worked so hard to accomplish? Two, why did Allah tell Jesus that his followers would be superior to unbelievers until the day of resurrection? Didn't Allah know that he was about to corrupt Christianity by tricking people into believing that Jesus died on the cross? Three, if the gospel was given as a guidance to mankind, why didn't Allah preserve his message instead of introducing a heresy? Four, once the Christian heresy had started, why did Allah help the heretical Christians spread their heresy instead of just correcting them? Five, if the gospel was corrupted in the early centuries of Christianity, why did Allah say that Christians still possessed it during Muhammad's time? Six, if Allah deceives people who follow his prophets, how do Muslims know he's not deceiving them? Seven, since Jesus' message was corrupted by Allah and others, what did Jesus ultimately accomplish? What did Jesus do? What was the point of the virgin birth and the miracles? What was the point of Jesus being the Messiah? What was the point? What did Jesus accomplish? After all of that, after all of that, his followers are led astray. Allah, Allah helped corrupt the message. Then the apostle Paul came in and he helped corrupt the message. Everyone corrupts the message and it was all pointless. Muslims will tell us, well, you know, he predicted the coming of Muhammad. Well, what's the point? 
What's the point of all of that? The, the, only, the only revelations we would have that would tell us that Muhammad is a prophet, the only scriptures Muslims would go to to try and show that Muhammad is a prophet and it's confirmed in our scriptures are the same sources that call Jesus the divine son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead, the same scripture, scriptures that tell us to watch out for false prophets. These are the same scriptures. So what, this is one giant massive mess. And think about the implications. God does all this work, then corrupts it. Jesus spends his life preaching Islam and he just fails miserably. He chooses followers to carry on that message. They just can't get the job done. And so Allah has to just put up with this for a long time, for 600 years until he fixes the mess. It, was Allah just unable to keep that message preserved? That's what I'm hearing from my Muslim friends, and that is what I find absolutely blasphemous. Oh.